You're listening to Inside iOS Dev, show about real-world iOS development. Today with you, your host, Alex Bush. Today, I'm going to talk about a new article that I'm publishing, or rather, it's not new per se. It's an update of uh, an article that I wrote several years ago, and then I kept updating it semi-regularly, maybe every other year. So the article's called iOS Interview Questions for Senior Developers in 2020. So that's the the original article that actually kicked off, um, kind of gave me the idea to write uh, the iOS Interview Guide book that I wrote a couple of years ago. Uh, But originally, that was the compilation of questions I kind of put together that I was asking other other devs on interviews as I, I was interviewing them. And then eventually it kind of grew into this uh, good curated collection of, you know, very um, typical questions, very important questions. uh, And I I structured them and eventually kind of the the book came out of that. So recently I updated it uh, for, well, again, for 2020. Uh, What I did, uh, I added a few more uh, questions to kind of expand on new additional stuff like uh, what is functional reactive programming and what's its place in iOS uh, today or uh, architectures, common common large-scale architectures such as Viper and Ribs. And and basically, and then, and then I went back and I kind of tweaked and revised a, f- um, a few other questions. I also added a further reading section for each each question. Um, you know, if you don't get enough information, because I it's still one article, right? Right? It's pretty large. It's probably like five thousand words at this point. But uh, if you you know the answer wasn't enough for you, and then each answer actually has expected answer, then red flag, and then the new section that I added uh, further reading. So if you want to well, dig deeper into that specific uh, the topic that, it, that the question covers, you can use those links. So in today's episode, I am going to... Oh, basically, I'll take a few questions out of, the, out of the article and I'll cover them and cover the, the, the material from the article, but also add some of my kind of thoughts that didn't get into the article itself. So the first question is, uh, what are the main features and advantages or disadvantages of uh, Swift? So this question kind of might sound like a beginner question, right? Why uh, senior senior developers get asked that? But then at the same time, uh, you could you could dig deeper and kind of show 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 your deep understanding of. Uh, language features or main language features and advantages and disadvantages of Swift over, let's say, Objective-C, but also over other languages uh, out there. So the TLDR um, and sort of expected answer, short answer, uh, main Swift features are static typing, protocols, reference types, value types, optionals, generics, and uh, f- uh, higher order functions, functional programming functions, such as map, filter, and so on. So the Swift is strongly typed language, which is uh, its sort of biggest feature and advantage and kind of disadvantage at the same time. Well, in some scenarios where you want to rapidly develop something and you don't want the compiler to um, kind of stop you and be in your way, but then at the same time, compiler could aid you in development uh, by you know, highlighting if certain protocol or some type wasn't implemented yet or, or needs to be fulfilled. Uh, but in overall, it gives you a greater determinism, if you will, of, of what you're working with and what are those types and uh, kind of greater uh, clarity on dependencies. Uh, the sort of Swift in that, because of that, Swift is, I mean, it is used on the back end, but it's more suitable, in my opinion, to, uh, towards client-side applications rather than back end. But nevertheless, the static typing system, it 
it gives you a lot of benefit and advantage of, uh, it, it helps you a lot with refactoring. So in that regard, um, uh, Swift is a very powerful language. Uh, a red flag that you could raise if you or answer a question like that on your interview, uh, basically, you know, if you can't articulate what's what's good about Swift, what are the advantages of that language, then it's kind of um, uh, it, it doesn't look good. Essentially, there is no red flag per se here unless you just simply cannot answer it. Uh, the further reading, if you want to dig deeper into, you know, all of the goodies and awesomeness of Swift, uh, Swift.org, uh, you can go there and read everything about Swift. There is a lot of documentation there. So another question, next question is, uh, what is an iOS application and where does your code fit into it? So this is um, sort of a big picture question. Uh, you might not get this question since pre precisely this form, uh, right, and, and phrased like that, like in, in my article. But in one form or another, you might be asked, sort of overall, where, well, like, where is your your iOS code lives in iOS system? So essentially, a quick TLDR for for this uh, question is iOS application is, if you think about it on the higher level, is just a little um, main function run loop, right? When the user taps on your app, that that's when everything starts, right? And then around that, we don't get to have a main main function or in iOS application specifically, unlike with uh, Mac apps. Uh, so we don't get to write code that will be executed in the main function, but what we do get is a wrapper around it. And it used to be in previous, before iOS 13, it's, um, well, there is a UI application that we don't control, and then app delegate um, that we implement that will um, will be responsible for getting uh, notifications from the UI application object, our, our apps application object. And that's effectively, you can think of it as a glorified wrapper around main function uh, within the system. Uh, after, like now, since iOS 13, we also, uh, app delegate was actually split into two. Now it's app delegate and scene delegate. And the reason for that, um, uh, previously app delegate was taken care of, it, it had too much responsibility. It was taking care of uh, the application lifecycle, but also the UI lifecycle of the application from the uh, standpoint of starting the UI and and uh, deallocating the UI. Uh, and then it also was handling other inputs from the system, which effectively would be another reincarnation of like main function calls, uh, such as push notifications or... Um, like deep linking and things like that, right? So now that got split. Uh, uh, now we have in iOS 13, we have scenes, which means your application could actually have multiple, uh, well, not just views, but multiple windows, if, if, if you think about it this way. Uh, and then, and that's scene delegate is what takes care of initializing those, and that responsibility was moved there. Uh, initializing and deallocating, uh, and it gets lifecycle callbacks about those, well, scenes, right? And again, effectively you can think of them as windows. And you could have multiple at the same time. And then app delegate, uh, that's, everything else is left there. So all the push notifications, all the background callbacks, uh, deep links, all, all of that. A red flag here that you could raise is is to think that your everything that your application is kind of all about is just MVC, right? Model view controller, and you know your view controller is like the main thing. Well, yes, maybe for most of the applications, but then what you want, if you're asked something like that, you want to take a step back and to, uh, take a look at the big picture of like where your application fits overall. So for further reading, 
Uh, I recommend uh, taking a look at UI application delegate documentation and UI, UI scene delegate documentation. Apple has uh, pages for both. Then they have three articles. Uh, one is responding to the launch of your app. Uh, it's also on developerapp.apple.com. And then two others, preparing for UI to run in the foreground and preparing for UI uh, to run in the background. And uh, last question for today that I'll cover, how is memory management handled in iOS? Uh, very fundamental question, in a way very basic, but I, regardless you know, whether you're interviewing for a senior position or a junior position, that always gets asked, right? Um, so TLDR, we, we have automatic reference count, uh, counting, ARC, uh, that's opposed to, uh, uh, or uh, it's a substitution for what we had before, which was manual reference counting. Th uh, the idea is that instead of having a garbage collector, uh, we don't have it in Swift and iOS, uh, uh, instead of having a garbage collector that takes care of, of the memory and uh, uh, deallocates objects automatically for you, with the reference counting, every time you initialize an object, uh, the, it, it has a reference count of one by default. And then every time you assign it to a property, it, the, the reference count increases by one. So previously with manual retain count, you had to every time when you unassign uh, for, uh, your object from a property, you had to decrease the reference count by one to kind of do the counter action, right? And and when the reference count uh, got got to zero, that's when the system would uh, deallocate the object. Now it's all handled for you by Arc, but you have to uh, pay attention um, to uh, how you def declare your properties. So by default, when you uh, uh, declare properties, they are strong reference properties, meaning they automatically will increase under the hood that counter by one. If you declare a property, and, and when you unassign it, it will automatically be decreased by one. But if you're, um, uh, if you don't want that to happen, for example, in case when you don't want circular dependency between two, two objects, you would want to declare one of them, one of the properties as weak. That basically what it does, it makes, it allows you to assign this object to a property but, uh, just like you normally would, but the property uh, it doesn't increase this object's reference count. So it's still, you'll have the reference, but um, it it doesn't, well, yeah, it doesn't increase the count. So when you're trying to deallocate it, you won't have circular dependency. Same goes for assign. You could also declare a property as an assigned property. I think that's the name. The The same idea, just like with the weak property, the, the retain count is not going to be increased. But weak property, there is a safeguard. Weak property is an optional property. So you would have to do an unwrap check whether you know the value is present or not. But with assign, it's more dangerous. You, it's not an optional property, so you might try to access it, but it could be deallocated. So use it with caution. Um, so yeah, I mean, the red flag here is, well, simply not knowing about it uh, because uh, it's just it's so basic for every iOS developer, memory leaks and, and crashes due to memory leaks or issues uh, are very common. So, uh, uh, read about it. And the further reading uh, for this question is autom automatic reference counting. It's in swift.org docs. It's docs.swift.org. Uh, you'll find link, uh, specific link in the, in the article. Uh, but yeah, that, that goes deeper into the details of how ARC works. All right, guys, that's it for today. Um, I'll cover more questions from the article in future episodes. Good luck on your interviews. 
And as I mentioned at the top of the episode, I actually wrote a book about iOS interviews. It's called The iOS Interview Guide. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave, a, leave a link in the show notes. Uh, the book covers questions like these and more, and it breaks them down and structurizes them into uh, groups such as storage questions or service questions or UI questions or fundamental questions and so on. So it could be a good help for you for your interview prep as well. And uh, you can reach us at Inside iOS Dev on Twitter or email us at hello at InsideIOSDev.com. See you next time.